Humanities Nebraska has supported the series. Can't hear? It's on. Humanities Nebraska is, has been supporting this series for the last year, and we acknowledge their support again this year. Uh, if there's a problem with weather in the next two lectures, I don't expect any, but if there is, we'll have a posting at the Unitarian Church website. Uh, next October, we are tentatively planning a joint OLLI WLS One Day Symposium to follow up on this year's 2017 Winter Lecture Series topic of income inequality. Everyone on the Winter Lecture Series email notification list will get a timely information, and it will be announced by OLLI in the OLLI course bulletin. So just keep that in mind that we had one last year which was very successful, and we are going to continue to cooperate with OLLI to organize this symposium in conjunction with the Winter Lecture Series. Uh, in the first three lectures, our speakers have focused on an overview of the topic of income and wealth inequality, inequality in Nebraska, and the role that the economic inequality may have played in the recent presidential election. Today's talk by Professor Bridget Goosby deals with another facet of inequality, how inequality in healthcare can arise from racism and discrimination. Before introducing Dr. Goosby further, I'd like to draw your attention to the next week's presentation by Chuck Collins. Mr. Collins is a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies. His talk, Reversing Extreme Inequality, Changing the Story and Fixing the Future, will focus on solutions to the problems arising from economic inequality. Indigo Bridge will be on hand to sell Dr. Collins' recent book, Born on the Third Base, a recent listing of the book on PBS News Hour's Art Beat website includes it among the five books, I'm quoting here, five books that will make you think about what it means to be human. So be sure to mark your calendar for this event and spread the word among your friends. Our speaker today, Dr. Bridget Gooseby, is Hapold Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. About a year and a half ago, I, along with some other members of the Winter Lecture Series Committee, attended a community conversation with Dr. Gooseby at the Malone Center, where she engaged a group of about 40 people in a very lively discussion on the work that she was doing on the topic of her talk today in partnership with the Malone Center and other local organizations. Therefore, when we learned that our speaker for today had to cancel his engagement, for health reasons, we asked Dr. Gooseby if she would be able to step in, and we were very pleased that she very graciously accepted our invitation to participate on a short notice. Dr. Gooseby earned her doctorate in sociology and demography from the Pennsylvania State University and was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Michigan under a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health. More recently, she concluded work as a mentored research scientist, an intensive career development award from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. In this work, she sought to identify biosocial pathways through which race-related stressors, such as discrimination, shape chronic disease risk among African Americans and other marginalized groups. This work demonstrated that the health-related consequences of discrimination may appear early in the course of life. Further, it illustrated the additive ramifications of race-specific stressors on minority health and overall life chances. Her research also examines the consequences in early life of economic and health conditions for chronic morbidity, risk in adulthood. Dr. Gooseby is a co-director of the Life and Frequencies Health Disparities Research Lab and her current research examines the role of 
psychological arousal in response to experiencing various forms of discrimination. Interestingly, this research employs mobile technologies in assessing moment by moment physiological stress reactivity in real time. I invite Dr. Goosby to make a presentation. I have to wet my whistle for a minute here. <laughs> Oh, I'll eventually start wandering, but I have a loud voice. Okay. So can people hear me? No. No? Okay. Can you hear me now? This sounds off. Okay. No? Oh. This one's off? <laughs> okay, we're going to get this. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I am in church. All right. <laughs> Okay, so um, thank you so much for the invitation, the unexpected invitation to be here. Um, it's my pleasure to come in and share my thoughts on some of this work. Um, I, and so as Sherrod mentioned, I actually have a project, um, I have dating collection on campus happening. I'm not talking about that specifically in this talk, but during Q&A, if anyone's interested in learning more about the kind of work that we're doing right now on campus with students of color, um, feel free to ask me and I can elaborate more on that. And so, as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about the consequences of racism and discrimination for minority health. And so this is a topic that I've been working on since getting funding from the National Institute of Health to study what are the processes through which certain populations are more vulnerable to illness than others. And so particularly for African Americans, um, one of the conditions that can be related to this is um, the inequality associated with race. And so I'm going to talk more in detail about that today and how that process gets under the skin, not necessarily through healthcare access, but literally the process through which this chronic stress exposure that African Americans deal with on a day-to-day -day basis can literally change their physiologies in ways that make them more vulnerable to illness. And so I'd like to start today with a quote from um, an esteemed colleague at the University of, um, at Harvard University, Dr. David Williams. Um, he says that in his keynote address for the American Sociological Association, that racial disparities in health are a stark symbol of the historic and ongoing racial inequalities in society, and they reflect the enduring effects of institutionalization of inequality for stigmatized groups. They are a potent reminder of the many miles that we still need to journey to achieve equality. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today is this process of equality or the lack thereof that can shape the health of, of particular <coughs> groups who are targeted by things like racism and discrimination. So I'm going to organize my talk today about around the fo um, following. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the present racial climate um, in the United States. I think that that's actually a pretty meaningful thing to at least mention here. Um, I'm going to talk about then understanding race and health beyond just looking specifically at income inequality because it's a much more nuanced story um, than income inequality per se. Um, third, I'm going to talk about how this process of experiencing racism and discrimination get under the skin um, over the life course of African Americans and how that shapes their health overall. And then I'll give you some of my final thoughts on what I think are important and meaningful regarding this kind of work. 
And so I think that you know, we can't really talk about inequality, and particularly at this moment, without recognizing that you know, in the highest um, station of the land right now, we have a person who espouses openly and publicly racist, xenophobic, and sexist commentaries about populations in the United States. And at this highest level, when you have this kind of um, comfort, this, can, this doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it's not divorced of the general context of the United States at present. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center actually put together this map of active hate groups in the United States at present. And so this includes groups like the Ku Klux Klan, neo-Nazis, white nationalists, racist skinheads, a number of different groups that have popped up throughout the country. Um, and so there are 917 um, active hate groups in the United States. And so this is actually an increase. So what's been interesting was that during Obama's presidency, one of the or, um, types of groups that emerged through, um, that was measured also by the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, an increase in certain population, in certain groups um, that were in some of these um, patriot groups that emerged, we had this striking uptick in patriot groups during um, President Obama, our first African American president president's time in office. And so these groups, the spike happened, and we can kind of think of these groups as kind of quasi-racist groups. Um, they're not specifically concerned with racism per se, but more interested in just being concerned about, um, growing concerned just in general, not just about blacks, but about immigration status, things of that nature, the Minutemen, who are the kind of vigilantes up and down the, um, the Mexican to, um, US border. Um, and so these particular groups kind of stood in, in some ways, for hate groups. And so they started to decline in prevalence. But what we've seen of late um, in 2016 and in 27, now and in 2017, is there's been an increase. Southern Poverty Law Center um, has great data, and the Pew Research Center have great data on what's going on in terms of hate-related experiences in the US. And according to them, the, their research, there have been a, there's a 197% increase in Muslim hate groups. And that's actually driving the uptick in hate groups in the United States. So while we've seen a bit of a decline in patriot groups, we've seen an uptick in hate groups in the United States during this time. And so what we're seeing, one of the scary results of this is that um, Muslim, anti-Muslim assaults on Muslims are at the highest levels they've been since the 9-11 era. Um, and so this is a population at tremendous risk of exposure to um, violent um, kind of religion and racist beha related behaviors and thoughts. The other, um, another population who's being targeted right now, we've seen an uptick in um, aggression towards uh, the Jewish population. We've seen there have been bomb threats to Jewish centers, um, the desecration of grave sites of, of Jew in Jewish cemeteries. And so these populations are ones where we're seeing this escalation. And so, this becomes important because I'm going to be talking about the African American population who has for, it's hard to even put into words, like they've been going through exposures to stressors related to their membership of their group um, in ways that have been alarming and shocking um, prior to the election and has been part of just kind of the fabric of society. And so in terms of exposures that African Americans have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is being threatened by the police. Um, we've had um, a series of highly publicized events where um, police have killed unarmed African Americans. And so this is an ongoing constant stressor in reality, not knowing when you may or may not be experiencing some sort of violence at the hands of a person who has racist intent. And so these have become really important issues for this particular population and for African African Americans led to this emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which was in response to the constant violation of African Americans' bodies through um, being killed or um, beaten by the police and in other situations. And now let us not forget that there was also the Charleston massacre that happened last year, um, where Dylan Roof went into, white supremacists went into a church in South Carolina and killed nine parishioners while they were in Bible study. And so we have a series of kind of indications of what kinds of concerns that are specific to marginalized or targeted populations are happening in the United States. And so why does this matter um, for health? What are the issues around health when it comes to this kind of situation? Well, I'm going to take a moment to share with you an article that really just um, 
it was incredibly moving and deeply troubling, um, but a, pa a paper, a research study that really showed the importance, the jump to, okay, why we care about this, but why, do, why should we do something about it? So this is about um, basically the population at risk and what it means for our democracy if we don't address issues around inequities in health. So this article was called Black Lives Matter, Differential Mortality and Racial Composition of the U.S. Electorate Between 1970 and 2004. So basically the goal of this study was to see if um, when we are able to look at black-white differences and, and death in the United States, there's a difference. There's an excess number of African-American deaths relative to whites. So if we look here, this is the gap. So this is age at death. So this is in the black population using the multiple causes of death index. And so what it shows is that at birth, the red line is for blacks, the green line is for whites. At the beginning of life, African Americans are more likely to die um, relative to whites. This is a significant large difference. But the biggest difference that we see in African American excess death happens between the ages of 40 and 65 years old. Okay, And this is significant. Um, the reason it's significant is because in ages 40 to 65, are the prime voting ages. This is the data for the age distribution of the voting population in 2004. So um, a large number of African Americans during at this particular point in the life course have already died. And so what they actually were able to show was that during the ages of 40 and 65, um, 40 and 65 um, for the election outcome of 2004, we're talking about when Bush ran against John Kerry, um, that year, there was an excess of more than a million African American lives in that particular period. And of that, 900,000 of those were in prime, well, actually it was a million who were in prime voting age. And of that, 900,000 of those votes were projected to have gone to John Kerry. So had African Americans not had that huge differential in mortality at that particular age range, it would have changed, it would have literally changed the landscape, our political landscape in the United States in 2004. Kerry would have won and there would have been um, um, potentially those close races in states that are now red might have actually been blue. And so what this means is that this really has implications. Having particular populations dying at excess rates she literally changes and shapes our electorate. And so what's important for, for this when it comes to the work that I do and what I'm going to talk to you more about in detail here is the fact that during that period in life, um, for African Americans, some, the assumption is that cause of death between the, those ages has to do with violent crime, um, so things like that. So, um, but what actually the situation is during that period is that African Americans are much more likely to be experiencing stress-related diseases, such as and they're dying from them, such as um, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Um, so these kinds of conditions are happening at a higher rate earlier in the life course for African Americans relative to whites. And we see this in the deaths at ages 36 to 55 in the United States. This is using the National Center Health Statistics. And the orange line and the yellow line, sorry, it's kind of showing up weird here. But the orange line and the yellow line here, um, that's um, the orange is African American men, the yellow is African American women. They lead um, in, among the blue is white, um, white males and the gray is white females in, card, in heart disease, death by heart disease. So African American men and women relative to white men and women are more likely to die of heart, cardiovascular disease or heart disease. I'm not gonna talk about it today, but African American women also lead in cancer deaths at this particular age range, 36 to 55, which falls into that prime voting age range. So what's important to note about these numbers um, that I wanna reiterate here is that these numbers um, are similar whether or not you account for socioeconomic status. So people higher in the socioeconomic gradient, even among African Americans, the gap still exists for them in this population. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. 
And so in sociological models, it's interesting. So here's a traditional model that's been used to um, talk about kind of health risk in African American populations. Um, so socioeconomic inequality and things like residential segregation leading to poverty concentration and exposure to violence. That this is the pathway that leads to what's called allostatic load or wear and tear on the body. So this pathway is argued that it's really about poverty and segregation driving this pathway to health risk for African Americans and that being a primary predictor. But what this kind of model does not actually explain is what, why is it that in higher African American, um, um, higher socioeconomic status population of African Americans, they still experience that kind of risk. And so um, a great study just came out by Kanitha Wilson and colleagues um, that looks at chronic disease risk among African Americans versus other groups um, who make $175,000 a year or more. And what they found in these um, records for medical expenditures was that, and the, mind you, the sample is 175K and above. Um, the blue is African American. Um, the orange is Hispanic, and the gray is Asian. And these numbers are compared to the white um, um, sample in the group. And so African Americans, you can see, are almost three times more likely to have hypertension, high-income African Americans, relative to high-income whites. They're also um, more than three times more likely to ex be experience diabetes um, than relative to whites. And they're more likely to be obese relative to whites in this population. So the question is, what's going on? Why is it that socioeconomic status, if giving people more money, is that really gonna fix the problem? What is the thing that is, this risk, what is this additional risk that's coming in here that is creating these kinds of conditions? And remember, and I actually didn't say this, but behavior can only explain so much because a lot of the work in health disparities research um, has really emphasized changing people's behaviors, but that's not necessarily the whole story here. And so I think the missing link here is actually um, racism and exposure to discrimination. Um, racism is about beliefs, attitudes, institutional arrangements, kind of interpersonal um, actions that malign a group of people based on their racial or ethnic affiliation. Um, discrimination is the action against people because they are part of a certain group. And racial and ethnic discrimination is kind of the merging of the two. That is unjust or prejudicial treatment towards certain groups based on their race or ethnic background um, are things that they're engaged in. And so as a sociologist, sociologists really are interested in structure. Um, and there was a sociologist named Barbara Reskin who described what's called uber discrimination. And basically, this is just kind of a web of connections. I'm sorry, you can't really see these tiny, I can barely see them. Um, but these paths that are about housing, right? housing, mortgage, segregation, school segregation, access to um, education, things like that. All of these things kind of drive discrimination in the United States. The foundation of our country is inherently unequal. And these processes, we're all embedded within these processes um, that end up ultimately shaping our outcomes. And so we can't really talk about inequality in this country without talking about the role that race racism plays across a variety of different um, organizations, but also at the interpersonal level. And so why is this important in terms of the work that I do? So I'm interested in life course health outcomes. And I'm interested in why it is that African Americans, can we trace when this inequality begins um, in, these, in this population? And so why it's important, I think it, it matters because inequality is inherent from the starting gate in this country. As I showed you in that pig figure from the Rodriguez article, um, the gap between the mortality gap between African Americans and whites already exists at birth. So this is before you know any sort of kind of individual behaviors kind of take place um, that this is happening. And so um, we can also think about the process through which all of us are embedded into these social and historical processes that shape our health trajectories. So these inequalities are something that we are all going to be affected by, um, and we're all embedded in like at this particular historical 
historical moment where we've got the kind of president that we have um, is going to have impacts that reverberate in ways that we don't actually know in the grand scheme what it's going to do in terms of our, um, you know, in terms of the livelihood of the country and what this means for minority groups in this country. Um, and so, you know, I guess in 10 years we'll be able to revisit it and see what happens. But um, this idea of inequality from the starting gate is really important because from, like I said, there is this inequality that emerges right at the early life course, but also there's a point at which interpersonal interactions and discriminatory experiences become a risk for people as they get older as well and they move into different social circles. And so one thing to keep in mind is that for African Americans who are middle class, there's certain types of discriminatory experiences that they're much more likely to experience. And and um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But what's important to note here is that that exposure to discrimination can take an already big difference in poor health risk. And the purple line is for whites and the blue line is for blacks. Um, that this risk can accelerate over time. And for African Americans, exposure to discrimination can increase the health risk and accelerate the difference even more um, over the course of their life. And that's what I'm primarily interested in, is kind of tracing these pathways of risk. And so what this means, and this is really important, is that the stress-related disease profile for African Americans is different from whites, and it's not because of some inherent genetic difference. This is a difference that has to do with the types of living situations and social interactions that they're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. And so here are some of the stress-related disease numbers for African Americans compared to whites. And so African Americans, as I mentioned, are at much higher rates. Um, so this is the black African American, and this is whites. African Americans drive the high um, numbers of low birth weight in the U.S. And African Americans uh, have always been more likely to have low birth weight births, um, and they're actually. Um, what becomes challenging about this and troubling about this as well is the fact that African American women who have high levels of education, so middle class African American women, are more likely to have a low birth weight birth than a white woman with a high school degree. So yeah, um, it's pretty alarming. So this is a situation that people are still trying to figure out what the processes are, and I'll give you some um, kind of hypotheses on why that might be. But these rates are actually mirrored in death, ra death rates, infant mortality rates among whites versus African Americans. Also, at higher uh, African American women at higher SES are more likely to have um, an offspring die in the first year of life relative to whites. And so they are a major, um, this is a major public health concern for the African American population population and one that is a risk across socioeconomic status. In addition, across socioeconomic status, African Americans are more likely to experience hypertension. Um, they are also more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes in adulthood, and they have worse um, cardiovascular health, positive cardiovascular health indicators relative to whites. And finally, they are more likely to die from heart disease. So this is white males, white females. This is black males, black females um, for cardiovascular disease risk mortality. Um, cardiovascular disease mortality. And so the theoretical pathway that, I, that drives the work that I do is one that mo um, is modeled by um, theorist named Dr. Rod late, late Dr. Rod Dr. Rodney Clark. And what he argued was that racial discrimination um, is a stressor. And it's a stressor that gets under the skin and causes the body to have a physiological stress response. So your body literally responds, responds to that stress and it accumulates over time. And that accumulation, in turn, um, can lead to stress-related um, stress illnesses. This is what makes African Americans more vulnerable to illness. It is, not necessarily, um, it is not necessarily all about socioeconomic position, but it's the chronic stress of exposure um, to racism on a daily basis that can exacerbate um, risk. 
So I'm gonna take a step back because I wanna talk to y'all just for a minute about how this process of stress gets under the skin because this is a kind of universal issue, right? Like we all experience stress. We experience it when we are in a traffic jam. We experience it on our jobs. We experience it you know, when our kids are acting crazy, right? So there's like any number of ways that we can experience stress. And so our bodies respond basically the same way regardless of the type of stressor. And so there's what we call this fight or flight response. Right? And so our body has three important systems that respond to stress that when they become chronic, they can lead to disease risk. And that's the vascular system, the endocrine system, and the immune system. And so in the vascular system, that's comprised of our heart, our lungs, arteries, and things like that. These are part of what's called our sympathetic nervous system. And so this system, when we are experiencing stress, like if we're walking on through the savanna and a lion is stalking us, evolutionarily, one of the first things that would happen is that we would make a decision about whether we were gonna run or whether we were gonna fight. And when that happens, your heart rate increases. Um, that means that you have this elevated level of activity, um, your blood wants, you're pumping more blood through your system so that you can have more oxygen and energy to run or fight. Um, so what this means for a stress-related disease, let's think about a particular condition, such as hypertension. So if you're experiencing stress and you experience it chronically, one of the things your body can't do is it doesn't necessarily slow down your blood pressure, um, your heart rate and blood pressure down to a recovered level. And so if you're experiencing chronic stress, this means that your arteries can get damaged from the high blood pressure. This can lead to um, calcification of your arteries, but it can also lead to being chronically high blood pressure or having hypertension. So this is one risk factor that's related to chronic stress just more generally. So then we go to the endocrine system. So this system is responsible for secreting hormones. Um, it's also responsible for our metabolism. And so it sends our, our endocrine system is always sending signals throughout our body to process um, through our bloodstream. And so here's another condition that can be affected by stress um, that is part of this endocrine process, and that's diabetes. And so I'm not gonna go into too much detail for this and just to say that this is what's called our HPA access um, system. That's our stress system. Um, and part of our stress system is when we perceive something as stressful, we have this stress hormone called cortisol that gets flushed throughout our system. And cortisol is responsible for our func mood, our functioning and processing of fat. Um, it's also there for managing our energy storage and our sleep. And so cortisol, one of the things it does when you get stressed out, is it tells your body, okay, stop taking up blood sugar into your blood cells because we need sugar available for energy immediately so that we can fight or run. And so you need that energy. And what happens is if you're experiencing chronic stress, because one of the things that your body does is it tells insulin to stop being effective. Insulin is the thing that helps us process our blood sugar in an efficient way. And if it is not being listened to, that means we have elevated levels of blood glucose circulating throughout our systems. And what this means chronically is this can lead to situations where you have what's called type 2 diabetes. And so this is one of those conditions, again, that can elevate the risk. Stress can elevate the risk of exposure to it. And finally, the immune system. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail except to say that based on the exposure to stressors, you can either have a suppressed immune response, which means you may be more likely to get infections, but you can also have an autoimmune response, which is your body attacking itself in the absence of any sort of toxins. And so in the context of experiencing discrimination, um, chronic exposure to discrimination can lead to elevated constant levels of stress reactivity via these messages that um, can, are continue to chronic disease risk in the population. I won't go into too much detail, but what it also does is for women who are pregnant, um, prenatal stress can actually shape the outcomes of the fetus as well. And so that women who are exposed to um, chronic levels of stress flush that stress hormone cortisol into the womb. Um, and this can change the metabolism of their offspring um, as well as their risk of experience of their offspring having things such as diabetes. But this is part of the body's protective response telling the fetus that it's going to be growing up in a stressful environment so the fetus needs to be prepared physiologically 
physiologically for what's coming next, which means that they may not be able to efficiently metabolize fat. And I can talk a little bit more about that in Q&A if people want to know more. But this process here is suggested to be part of the process that leads to the risk of um, high levels of infant mortality in African Americans as well as low birth weight birth. And so again, this is a complex issue, but I'm not going to go into too much detail about that right now. Um, what's important to note is that I'm going to skip these um, and just talk about um, the importance of racism-related stress. So I said a moment ago that there are certain types of stressors that um, middle-class African Americans are more likely to experience. And this is not to say low-income African Americans don't experience them either, but the type of chronic kind of ongoing stress that middle-class African Americans experience um, can have just really damaging consequences for their health. And that includes um, the role of racial microaggressions. This is commonplace verbal or behavioral indignities that happen to a group of people, whether it's unintentional or intentional, that can lead to, you know, feelings, um, they communicate racism, hostile, derogatory, and negative slights and insults to a population um, or to an individual as this interpersonal interaction is happening. Also vicarious racism. And so this is experiences of other people that are part connected to that group um, observe and report. And so this is important to note because consider what it means for African Americans to have to see in real time unarmed African American men um, and women being brutalized by the police and in some cases shot and killed. What does it mean for a group of people to see a little 12 year old get shot to death unarmed by the police? Um, you know, Tamir Rice. And so these are the kinds of situations where while they're not happening to that person, um, the fact that it's happening to someone that looks like them and they see that happen, that can be a continual trauma for the people that are part of that population. And finally, there's the role of vigilance. This is a race-specific stressor, and this is about the expectation of experiencing discrimination. And so our minds tend to encode things when they encode things as stressful. Um, our bodies then prepare for the next day, expecting, predicting that kind of stressor, again, potentially, depending on how many times it happens. And so this exposure, just literally the work of having to prepare or expect to experience some sort of microaggression or discrimination can also be tremendously stressful and can have consequences for subsequent health outcomes. And so in my own research, I've actually looked at whether we can explain away um, stress-related diseases by just looking at socioeconomic status. And I obviously, the punchline is, is that in my, one of my newest papers, I find that actually socioeconomic status does not explain these differences um, in African American, young African American men and women and white men and women. But it also doesn't, it's, um, education is not protective for African Americans. So we think about if you just get a PA, if you just get a doctorate, or if you just get even your BA, you're going to be, you know, this is going to protect you from these kinds of risks. But it doesn't actually, and this research I did shows it. And this was actually um, a separate set of authors did a separate study using a different data set looking at hypertension, whereas I looked at cardiovascular disease and found similar results, that African Americans were not protected by having higher levels of education. They were still at a higher risk of experiencing cardiovascular disease risks. And so to go back, what this means is that when we talk about the life course, so that was work that I did that's about basically about adulthood. But when it comes to measuring, there's a growing body of literature looking at the role of discrimination explicitly um, and how that is correlated with African, Amer with African American health outcomes. And one of the things that's been really interesting is there have been studies that have shown that discrimination exposure is associated with low birth weight and preterm births among African American women. So women Women who reported experiencing more discrimination were more likely to have unhealthy births. So I also like, I, I study children and adolescents because I think that this life course process of exposure to discrimination starts young. It starts a lot earlier. And so a lot of the work that I've done previous, some of the work that I've done previously, and I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A, has been looking at adolescent populations, and actually a lot of it locally, 
um, and how their experiences and exposures to, to discrimination are affecting their health. And so why did I pick adolescents? Um, you know, they are a complicated group and that are all in their feelings at this particular moment, but they're also a group that can really truly recognize when they're being treated unfairly and can begin to verbalize it. And so adolescence is a key um, developmental period of exposure because they're going through biological changes at that time that are really stressful for them. Um, they're also going through social transitions. So they're transitioning away from home and more with their friends and peers. Um, and finally, uh, they have behavioral trajectories during adolescence start to solidify. So eating habits we have tend to start solidifying when we're adolescents, kind of smoking and drinking, like risk behaviors begin to start solidifying as we get to that age and aging into early adulthood. And so this becomes an important group to study like how these processes of health um, risk work. And so what's really interesting about this population is that I did, I did work um, looking at the role of racial school, compos school racial composition for adolescents' health once as they transition into adulthood. And so one of the things that I found in this work was that African American kids who were in schools that were predominantly white were more likely to have worse health in adulthood um, than African American kids who were in more integrated schools. I also found that with my colleagues that depressive symptoms in African Americans in predominantly white schools, they're at higher risk for more depressive symptoms into adulthood. And one of the things I argue here, because I can't measure discrimination specifically, but I do know um, one of the things that previous research tells us is that African American youth in predominantly white environments are more likely to be exposed to discriminatory experiences from their peers, from their teachers, feel socially isolated. So so um, even though they may be more likely to get a better education um, in predominantly white schools because those schools tend to be in better neighborhoods, um, it's at a cost for them. And that cost for them is that they're exposed to these daily discriminatory experiences. And so this is kind of um, this work that I did around middle class African American adults. This is kind of building on this is that background risk that expo risk exposure that these young people might experience that can shape that later adulthood outcomes. And so in addition to kind of looking at um, these kids, that was like a national study, I became interested in trying to get at Socio, um, how um, discrimination is related to like cardio, objective measures of cardiovascular risk. And so what I decided to do is I collected data in Omaha through health fairs in North Omaha. And North, as many of you know, Omaha is a hyper-segregated city where African Americans are primarily in um, North Omaha. And so they have very, very high rates of poverty. And so what I wanted to do was take out the noise of socioeconomic status. So hold that constant by looking specifically just at low-income African Americans, and then ask the question, does discrimination affect their health? So they're already poor, but what do we know about, will discrimination have an additive effect on their health? And so what I found, which I was actually pretty shocked by, all you need to look at is the direction, the positive direction of these numbers. So what I found was in collecting blood spots from African Americans um, at these health fairs, um, I was able to measure, ooh, ooh. I was able to measure um, inflammation, systemic inflammation, which is a risk for cardiovascular disease through what's called C-reactive protein. And I had looked at blood pressure. So kids between, the, kids between the ages of 10 and 14 years old um, in this study were more likely, if they reported more discrimination, had higher levels of systemic inflammation and higher blood pressure. And this is 10 to 14. And what was shocking about this is that C-reactive protein is a measure that shouldn't be giving us these kinds of indicators until people are older. And so um, this really kind of solidified for me the importance of understanding this early um, in the life course. And it was actually um, mapped on to research out there already that shows that discrimination in adolescence is related to insulin resistance, which is a precursor to type 2 diabetes, adiposity, which is fat around the midsection. It's related to your stress, to stress system functioning in adolescence and immune functioning in adolescence. And in a local study that I just finished, we found that it was related to sleep. Um, and so these are key outcomes that are really important for the health of youth as they move into adulthood.
And so these markers actually mark, um, map onto racial discrimination and health markers in um, adulthood. And so adults who report discrimination are more likely to have higher blood pressure, they have higher levels of inflammation as well, higher abdominal obesity or adiposity, and they have more weight gain. So the more that they report experiencing discrimination, the higher their weight becomes, and elevated levels of low density or bad cholesterol. And so, again, to reiterate, there are these profiles, health profiles of African Americans that are important, which is um, they're at the highest rate, they have the highest rates of low birth weight and infant mortality, high risk of type 2 diabetes and hypertension, um, and abdominal obesity, and cardiovascular disease mortality and at earlier ages. And so not to say that, so before we kind of think about this as only a black problem, um, there was an interesting study that came out that looked at racism, measuring racism in the United States and mortality, just overall mortality risk um, in the United States. And so what these, um, this is a really creative study where they looked at how racism and racist attitudes shape health risk in the population. And they did a search, basically a Google search, and looked up, you know, <clears throat> The N word using, used in derogatory ways. They had a private Google database where they could get the actual locations that people did this, um, did these kinds of searches, and mapped it onto morbidities, um, morbidity or health, poor health, and mortality rates. And what they found was that um, in places where there were higher levels of discrimination reports, people had higher levels of mortality in those places. And so the red are the places where they had the highest levels of kind of racist Google searches and use of the N-word in a derogatory way. Those were also the places that had the highest rates of mortality um, <clears throat> in, in these particular areas. And so what they often, they said that these patterns were similar across not only mortality, but stroke, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And one of the things that they argued is that, you know, it's just, just the sheer inequality and the exposure to inequality um, and these kinds of racist ideologies, how they merge together, that create these kinds of risks when you have, you know, racist lawmakers making policies and things like that. They can go to a structural level and impact people's health. And so what I support and I think is an important thing to look at is, and um, so Child Trends had a report where they argue that um, Black History Month uh, should be considered, um, is the time where we should think about, we just, this was February, was Black History Month, racism as a target for intervention. We should be considering the role of racism in health risks and health risk behaviors in the United States among, popula in, among populations of risk. And like I said, though I'm focusing on African Americans here, um, this is about targeted populations in general and the risks that, the health risks that they accrue when they're exposed to these kinds of stressors. And we could, like I said, we could elaborate this to include trans populations, LGBT, pop um, LGB populations, uh, Muslims, Latinos, and so, hmm, my computer just froze. Uh-oh. So I'm not really sure what's happening. Hmm. So I guess this is my computer telling me I should stop. <laughs> wow, it just like freaked out. So let me see if I can get back to my slide. Okay, now I can get back. I think it's like angry at me for talking about racism today. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to, um, really just kind of end on an important kind of light at the end of the tunnel about this. Um, so the work that I'm doing around looking at biological markers and how they're related to the stress of discrimination, and some of this work that looks at discrimination and kind of this cardiovascular disease risk, what these research studies, studies are showing is that there are concrete effects of racism for health outcomes. It's not just in the heads of the people who are experiencing it, but it can shape the outcomes for people in those populations. Populations. And this is also a type where we can really push the dialogue and seriously discuss, like, what does it mean to target racism explicitly? Because colorblind policies are not effective. And finally, I hope that this can be fuel for mobilizing and supporting people who are in these targeted groups because they can't do it on their own. Um, none of us should have to really survive these kinds of situations by ourselves. And we need allies in order for us to be a more functional population and a healthier population.
population. And I wanted to end with this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that says, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. And so I'd like to be on, in that camp in believing that we can fix this, but we have to start somewhere. So thank you. High schools that have a small percentage of blacks mm -hmm. being worse for blacks because mm -hmm. I went to a high school that was, was about 5% black. Okay. It was the only high school in town, so that's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, two out of the three years I was there, blacks were president of the student council. Mm -hmm. And the year before I was there, it was also a black who was president of the okay. student council. Uh -huh. So I had the impression that things were pretty positive for, mm -hmm. for blacks. Am I, was I missing a lot of stuff? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Your president was just black. He was elected, and there was a hell of a lot of discrimination against him. Oh, that was appalling. Um, and so, yeah, so while you saw externally some one thing, um, what was happening to that student um, was is a very different thing. And so I think one of the things that's kind of important about this work is the fact that, you know, while a person of color might perceive being exper experiencing discrimination, um, people around them may not even recognize that it exists. And there might be situations where the student council president might even say, oh my God, I experienced this sort of aggression, but, you know, their white colleagues are like, oh, it's all in your head, you're overreacting, get over it. These kinds of things can happen. And so I think that, you know, it, the narrative is one that, and the story is one that there's a whole other complicated side to it um, that white people tend to not recognize is actually happening because they never had to experience it. So, yeah, so I would say that they probably experienced some, you know, they may have been popular enough to be elected by the elected president of their classes, but that does not protect them from racism. So out of curiosity, where did you grow up? Austin, Texas. Oh, okay, so. Not very diverse. That's a good place in the bad stage. <laughs> it, it is a good place, but I experienced alarming rates of discrimination living there. Um, so it's not, okay. you know, it's an, again, um, it's just oh. a part of the fabric of our country. It is a reality that, it, I mean, our country is literally founded on racism, the eradication of a population that was already here, and the subjugation and enslavement of another population. So this is like our foundation. Our first presidents had slaves, right? So there's a whole rationale um, that has kind of, it, it, we, you're not divorced. I'm so, yeah. sorry to hear that also was worse than I would have guessed. Well, no, but I mean, it, you know, kudos to them for, for being able to do it. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's awesome. So, but yeah, it's, it's hard, it's not easy. Don't forget to keep these people off your back. <laughs> <laughs> Get yourself something to drink and, and a snack. If okay, you, if you like. thank There's you. There's food out there, you know, we take about 15 minutes. I appreciate it, explained it all to you. Yes, we have all Okay, and then we'll do q and Yeah, sounds good. And <laughs> we will really end at nine. All right. Sharp. Keeper of the time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's walk this way and talk. Walk along. You didn't talk about it. I didn't because I didn't want to get into the complexities. Yes. Yes. And so, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. Okay, and we gotta give ourselves a little power. Yes. <laughs> 